programme we now have a tonight with Trevor McDonald special. Tonight, Britain's worst rail crash for 50 years. Was it a disaster waiting to happen? Could the same thing happen again? The death toll mounts. Were lives lost needlessly? They are not prepared to spend more than a certain amount of money per life being saved. And of course, they've got it wrong. Reliving the horror, the passengers who got out alive. Well, I'm now getting extremely angry because I think it just seems like bloody south all again. Also tonight was this signal at fault. It was money, money, money all the time. And this is the reason that we face this very sorry state of affairs today. Lessons from abroad. Why aren't our systems as safe? If I don't reduce the speed, the system will break. There. You have it. The stories that matter to you. Tonight, with Trevor MacDonald. The search for bodies continues tonight. With 28 already recovered, police say another 100 people remain unaccounted for. Good evening. The scale of the Paddington Rail disaster grows worse with every passing hour now. By yesterday lunchtime, seven people were confirmed dead. By last night, that figure had climbed to 28. And this morning, there were predictions that the toll would rise to 50. Now, 36 hours after the disaster, there are fears that the final number of dead could reach well over 100. Tonight, we'll be looking at the possible causes of the crash asking why apparent safety warnings weren't acted upon and putting the question that everyone once answered, just who was to blame? But first, the very latest in the number of casualties. We're crossing live now to ITN senior correspondent Mark Austin, who is at the crash scene. Mark, could you give us any idea now of the latest estimate of the number of people who have died? Well, Trevor, it's very difficult. It could be 70, but much more likely it's going to climb towards 170, as you were uh, suggesting. The problem is they don't know exactly how many people uh, were on this train, and equally, they don't know how many bodies are left trapped in this wreckage here behind me. Uh, their problem at the moment is that they can't get the cranes and the heavy lifting equipment down to the track side, uh, where they're going to have to lift these carriages. Um, it's going to take 12 to 15 hours, I'm told, to erect this uh, crane equipment uh, when they finally get it here. And then they can start this business of lifting the carriages. Then there will be this gruesome discovery of how many bodies are underneath. And you can imagine uh, what sort of horrors will confront the rescue workers uh, when they start that operation. Indeed, Mark, we're hearing terrible stories about that difficulty, about uh, searching the burnt-out carriages. Tell us a little bit about those problems of identification that the police are having. Well, they're enormous problems. Uh, they're focusing specifically on this one uh, first-class carriage on the Great Western train, which was appallingly burnt and charred, uh, bore the brunt of this explosion. Uh, it became like an incinerator. And we're told there could have been 40 to 60 people in this first-class compartment. Uh, but a, a pathologist who has been uh, to inspect it says at the moment it is uh, basically eight feet of debris and ash. Uh, DNA testing probably won't work. Dental records probably won't work. It may be that these people are never identified positively. As you say, this is very difficult and very delicate work. Do the police and the other emergency services, have they given us any idea at all of when we will have a firm idea of how many people have lost their lives? I think it's very difficult to say, and given the, the problems we've just discussed, uh, we may never know how many people uh, died in this train. They've been asking people to phone in and say, definitely, I know that my husband or such and such a person was on this train. And they have got specific uh, leads like that. Other people have been less specific. It may be that uh, my friend was on that train or my husband was on that train. And other people have made malicious calls saying someone was definitely on it when they knew that they weren't. It's difficult to believe that that has been happening, but it is. We may never know how many people have died in this accident, Trevor. Mark Austin, thank you. The Train Drivers Union says its members have made repeated complaints about the signal, thought to be at the centre of the disaster. Reports suggest that the driver of the Thames train went through a red light at signal 109. But according to the union, that signal is difficult to see 
and it's been involved in eight separate safety incidents in the last five years. Here's ITN science editor Lawrence McGinty. An express train leaves Paddington along the fatal stretch of track that saw yesterday's accident. The driver knows he has automatic train protection, ATP. If he goes through a red light, ATP will stop the train automatically. The Thames train that left Paddington yesterday, like most in Britain, had a system that's 50 years old. Passing a warning light triggers an alarm, but pressing a button cancels the warning. Familiarity breeds contempt. The cancellation of the warning as they get the yellow lights become automa an automatic reflex action because in a typical shift, a driver might well pass uh, 50 or more yellow lights. Uh, he will get the warning every time. Each time he has to press the button when he hears the horn. This driver, who wanted to remain anonymous, said they're working under massive stress. Unless you're dead, all right, and you can't physically put your hand around that handle, or unless the trains are falling to bits and they can't get on the track, they will run trains. Red lights don't make the drivers stop. And that's what happened yesterday when the Thames train went through these lights outside Paddington. It's now clear from computer records at the main signal box that the slow train has these lights at danger. That is the fateful signal. Once the Thames train had passed that, it was on a course for disaster. But Railtrack knew that this was a danger zone. As this memorandum shows, the Train Drivers Union has been complaining about this gantry for years, saying that it's badly sighted. What's more, they say that eight drivers have passed these signals on red. Fortunately, accidents didn't follow. But yesterday, the driver and his passengers ran out of luck. The Thames train was switched to track three soon after leaving Paddington. As it approached signal 109, that signal was red. The Thames train passed it anyway and was now on a collision course for the points with track two. There, it was hit by the high-speed express. The only other option, having passed the red signal, were these points, which would have carried the train onto another working line, into danger again. There was nowhere to go. In the immediate aftermath of the Paddington disaster, it's perhaps too easy to blame human error. The data recorder logs technical information about the journey, but not the pressures on drivers working with old technology to new tight deadlines. What actually happened to me on one occasion was I'd actually lost 150 yards. I was, I was tired, my eyes got up and down, and try and put your head out the window. And I remember being at one spot, and the next minute I've heard this buzzer which woke me up, I've cancelled JWS, and noticed that I'd moved at least 200 yards up the track without realising. After this accident, the pressure is on to install modern safety systems, and especially automatic train protection in at least all high-speed trains. The man in the hot seat is the Deputy Prime Minister. I've talked to everybody concerned, and I'm doing everything I can to make sure that their concerns about the railway system, about its safety, are met. And you can be assured that's precisely what I'll do. It was a two-year delay. But could more people have survived yesterday's crash? The disintegration of the aluminium Thames train is causing experts concern. That uh, immediately uh, reminded me of the terrible accident in Germany at Eschede, where 98 people were killed in June last year because there, a feature of that was that the coach is literally unzipped at the, uh, at the welded joints. Now, the problem seems to be that the Thames train, Thames turbos, are made of aluminium panels, uh, which are welded together, and it seems that under extreme impact, and I do stress extreme, under extreme impact, those welds simply break. And that's a bit of a worry for the designers, and I think we're going to have to revisit that. Perhaps there's one positive side to this accident. It could be a defining moment, a shift in safety thinking that will make Britain's railways much safer. Well, as the day has gone on, more drivers have come forward to speak about the safety risks on the railways. For the latest on that, we can now go live to Lawrence McGinty in the ITN's newsroom. Lawrence, we've heard a lot today about uh, safety systems. Why weren't they adopted right across the board? I think you have to look at the cost for that uh, answer, Trevor. They were first recommended after the Clapham accident back in 1988. Um, but ever since then, they've been hovering in the wings and never been introduced. It's very difficult to say how much they do cost. Today, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister was saying the estimates he had were between 1 billion and 15 billion. 
But what we do know is that if you calculate, and there are people who do these kind of bizarre calculations, but if you calculate how much you would have to spend to save a life, with the automated train protection, it would cost you £14 million to save one life. The, the maximum that the railways want to spend is two and a half million. So the life just isn't worth enough to install this system. So, but if that system is not adopted right across the board, what are the alternatives and are they any good? Well, the government has gone for a lesser protection, uh, another technical system that again automatically stops the train if it goes past a red light and it gets in trouble. The problem with this system is that it only works if the train is going relatively slow. It only works if the train is going 60 miles an hour or less. And from everything we know, the express train yesterday was travelling at more than that, travelling at 70 miles an hour. It wouldn't have worked yesterday. Lawrence McGinty, thank you. Well, earlier tonight I took up some of those questions about safety when I spoke to the Transport Minister, Lord Macdonald whose department has promised to set up a public inquiry into the Paddington disaster. But I began by asking him what the latest information was and what sort of casualty figures we might expect. Well, uh, we, we hear with um, mounting horror the, the estimates uh, made by the Metropolitan Police that the casualties may be running into three figures now. Now, last week at your party conference, the message was, leave your car at home, take the train, Tonight we are facing the biggest rail disaster in 50 years. Why should anybody listen to you? Well, I think in a day like this, uh, it's not the time to, to argue about um, you know, political policies. I think obviously our thoughts are with the, the victims and, and with the families. But uh, what I can say is that we have been very active uh, since the, the disaster. And uh, as you may have heard, Sir uh, David Davis has been appointed today to do a very rapid assessment of train protection systems and to look at the question of uh, trains that pass through uh, red light signals. I'm glad you say you've been very active because have you established at all what really happened? Did the Thames driver go through two cautionary signals and then a red light at signal 109? Did he? Well, it wouldn't be possible for me uh, to confirm that. Uh, what I can say is that we've got our railway inspectors on the, the scene of the incident They'll be looking at all the information that's been available, both from the recorders in, in the trains and from uh, signal boxes and so on. I don't think we'll have too long to wait now for that information. We would anticipate that we would have it before the end of the week. First, signal 109. Now, eight times drivers have gone through it when it's been on red. People will find this not only shocking, but absolutely disgusting. Numerous complaints from the train drivers that they can't see it properly. Did this thing need fixing? If that was the case, why wasn't it fixed? Well, this is the question, of course, that the rail inspectors uh, will be asking of, uh, of rail track and uh, will be taking, no doubt, the, the evidence from train companies as well. I'm not in a position to give you that information at the moment. You see, we, we, we hear tonight that there's been a chronic problem of bad signalling at Paddington. Signal 63 now, we are told, is even worse than uh, signal 109. There have been complaints to the railway inspectorate. Rail track is having to reassess its signalling at Paddington. Now, this is one of the m most important railway stations in the country. What is, what is going on at Paddington? Have you had any thoughts about that at all? Yes, indeed. I think you'll, you'll find that our railway inspectorate uh, brought out the figures just a, a couple of months ago on the number of, uh, of red lights that had been passed by trains and declared that that was unacceptable. That's why just... Uh, um, at the same time, we announced that we would be introducing uh, this new train protection system and that that would be in over the next four years. We're looking urgently today uh, with RailTrack to see whether the implementation of that system can be accelerated. If the smaller commuter train had been fitted with ATP, would we have been talking about this terrible tragedy tonight? Would the accident have happened? Again, that's what Sir David Davis has to tell us, because we've got two systems here. The ATP system is installed in fast-track lines, uh, on a few lines, because it wasn't introduced uh, generally. Uh, it had been recommended after the Clapham disaster. It wasn't introduced except in a few uh, high-speed lines just in, across the last and few that years. I'm told, and that, I'm told, was because it was too expensive. What was it, two and a half million pounds for every life saved? was considered too high a price. I mean, I wonder whether that's the same assessment tonight. No, indeed. What we're looking at is that there is a system that we've been putting in place, which we're told by the safety experts would stop about 80% of, uh, of incidents 
And the pricing on that uh, that was given to us was that it would be around 150, uh, 200 million pounds. Now, the ATP system, uh, we have to be careful here, that uh, that might take twice as long to introduce as this other uh, safer safety system. Uh, so there's a question both of the time element here and there's a question too of whether it's actually uh, the right system for the breadth of the country. It seems to work on fast track lines, new lines, but we're not sure from the experience in France that's been reported to us that it would work across Britain. So that's why we've asked Sir David Davis, a man very experienced in these matters, to give us that opinion. Now, the price that had been put in the ATP system was a billion pounds. If it's a difference between 150 million and a billion, then you know, money won't be an object in implementing that. But who, who made that decision? Who said it was too much money? Who said that? Well, I think that's a decision that uh, goes back into the, into the previous times. And uh, as I say, I don't want it to looks make a very poor politics. It looks a very poor decision now. Well, I don't want to play politics with this, Trevor. This isn't the day for it, especially when we're hearing such great well, not With respect, I'm not trying to play politics. I'm just trying to, 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 to reflect what people are saying and the anger they feel about what, why this might have happened. Well, the previous administration did not implement this uh, policy. Um, for the, the reasons that, that, that they gave at the time. And uh, there are, I think, to, uh, there were difficulties for them because there weren't any alternative systems available, which there are now. Minister, if I can crystallize what you said about the money and about ATP, you said it's going to cost about a billion pounds to introduce it. And if all things are equal, you will not let that money stand in the way. You will introduce it. Certainly. And we'll take uh, Sir David Davis's uh, recommendations and we will implement those. So we can take that as a pledge. Indeed. Minister, thank you. Minister of Transport, Lord Gus MacDonald. It's believed that the trains were travelling at a combined speed of more than 100 miles an hour when they collided. The force of the impact led to a fireball, which then spread through the carriages of the high-speed Great Western train. The vast majority of the victims died as a result of their burns. But was enough done to stop the spread of the flames? This report is from ITN's Shuli Ghosh. It was, without doubt, a disaster of nightmarish proportions. The flames that engulfed the doomed passenger trains charred everything in their path beyond recognition. Several carriages were gutted, with passengers still trapped inside. The fire reached 300 degrees centigrade within 40 seconds. It will buckle the trains, it will buckle steel, it will buckle metal, and it will certainly give off large enough quantities of heat to pass it on to the next flammable material. Firefighters are on the front line at disaster scenes. They have special procedures to deal with railway fires. Yesterday, they had water on the flames within three minutes, but the damage was done. When you're confronted with a running fuel fire, you've got diesel fumes and diesel oil involved. they are likely to be met by a fire which is going to grow and grow in intensity. It's going to get larger and larger and larger to involve larger and larger parts of the train itself. If you're trapped inside one of the carriages, you're going to stand very little chance of survival unless you can get out. This carriage took the full brunt of the inferno. Miraculously, one man escaped. The lights went out immediately, the impact seems to occur. And very few, very few seconds afterwards, perhaps only one or two, the carriage was full of smoke. Fire had started outside the carriage. It was completely dark. And this, is all, this all happened, it seems to me, in retrospect, before the carriage had actually stopped. What I believe happened was that diesel must have uh, come out of the locomotive and been set alight by a spark. And this put the carriage on fire even before the carriage had stopped moving. It was getting hot. Although some of the windows had broken and thus there was air coming in, the carriage was already full of smoke by the time I was able to do anything. Incredibly, there are no specific regulations aimed at preventing or dealing with fires on board trains in this country. The Railway Inspectorate does provide guidelines which cover things like the fire resistance of materials, the availability of fire extinguishers and exits. But train operators can only be prosecuted under the Health and Safety at Work Act, which requires them to provide a duty of care for employees and passengers. Disturbingly, the guidelines only affect trains built after 1996. Both these trains are older. 
Four years ago, recommendations were drawn up after a train caught fire in Maidenhead. They included improving the fire resistance of service ducts and pipes to stop flames spreading so quickly. There's no evidence that's been implemented. There was another nightmare for survivors of yesterday's crash. Trapped in carriages rapidly filling with smoke and flames, many were unable to get out because the doors were jammed. Ironically, in the days of British Rail, £17 million was spent fitting trains with central locking door systems to stop people falling out. The, the doors are supposed to be fail-safe so that they do open in this sort of, sort of eventuality, or at least can be opened. Um, clearly, uh, in such an accident, the, some of the doors jammed because uh, uh, basically they, they were rammed uh, and, and, and wedged in by, by the metal. Uh, again, this is, this is a complex issue which uh, will have to be looked at very carefully by the investigators. One company has learned valuable lessons. Eurotunnel was faced with a huge fire on a freight train in 1996. No one was killed, but underground, the blaze took nine hours to control. The company brought in several changes to improve safety. Our trains themselves have a number of uh, safety features. Our tourist shuttles, for example, have uh, a fire detection system. Uh, the tunnels themselves have a, a fire detection system. The, they also have a number of fire suppression systems uh, within, the, uh, within the carriages themselves. Whatever the lessons to be learned from yesterday's crash, almost certainly new recommendations will be made. For those involved, it's too late. I don't know of anybody that's died that I know yet, but I am full of sympathy for, for the families of the people who went through this. I know that my wife had, tw there was 20 minutes between my wife hearing of the accident and, and hearing my voice at the end of the mobile phone. Um, for those people who didn't receive that call, I just feel the most extraordinary sympathy. Today, Prince Charles paid tribute to the medical teams who cared for the injured after the crash. In the last 36 hours, they've treated around 177 victims. Tonight, 36 remain in hospital. 15 of them are in a serious condition. The treatment techniques were learned from the experience of previous disasters, as Terry Lloyd now explains. 1952, and 112 passengers were killed when three trains smashed into each other at Harrow and Wilston Station. Ambulance men were quickly on the scene and rapidly began ferrying casualties to hospital. But it's now accepted that with proper training and experience, they could and should have treated them on the spot to limit the number of fatalities. In contrast, American servicemen from a nearby airbase went to the scene with combat medicine training. They had a different approach. Witnesses said they brought the hospital to the accident. 47 years on, and those lessons have been learnt and developed by Britain's ambulance crews. At Paddington yesterday, many passengers survived simply because one-time 999 drivers have become fully trained paramedics. Twenty years ago, the ambulance crew's main priority was to swoop and scoop, as they called it, to get a patient inside an ambulance and away as quickly as possible. Now, with the benefit of hindsight and modern-day training, the phrase is, stay and stabilise. From London's Ambulance Control Centre, paramedics give guidance over the telephone to their teams on the ground. John Pooley insisted on attending the Paddington crash scene. He'd helped out at the Clapham Rail disaster 11 years ago, and his father before him was one of the first ambulance men to reach Harrow. My father joined the job in the 1930s and was given a, a hat and uh, told to get on an ambulance and went out on his first emergency call 10 minutes after he joined and was told to get a first aid certificate from the local St John within the first nine months of, uh, of his employment. I'm, I'm actually convinced, as I was with Clapham, and I'm even more convinced with the incident at Paddington yesterday, that many, many more people would have died had it not been for the treatment that the ambulance staff gave on scene. Yesterday's emergency alert was for real. This was a training session organised by the University College Hospital a few days ago. Ironically, the scenario was a head-on train crash. Tuesday morning of this week, and rehearsal became reality for the staff. 
flames engulf the Paddington Express as they did Bradford's football ground in 1985. Burn injuries were amongst the worst complications then, but science and surgery have moved on. In the old days, uh, a 30 or 40 percent surface area burn in a, um, a middle-aged or elderly person would almost certainly be uh, fatal. Now, of course, with advances in resuscitation, uh, a patient can survive that sort of burn and, and, and invariably will do. Donna Marie McGillian suffered 65 percent burns as one of the victims of last year's Omar bomb. Her injuries could well have proved fatal. She survived thanks to the latest technology. It's hard to think that, that a year down the line that you're still undergoing treatment and you still have so many surgeries and um, so much other treatment to, to happen to you. Um, but at the same time, you're here and, and you, sh you should get on with it and, and let the doctors and nurses do what they want because they know what they're doing and, and their ultimate aim is to get you better so that they can discharge you from their treatment. Today's paramedics are trained and equipped to deal with burn victims. Without doubt, their speed and expertise saved many people yesterday. As a result, they, like Donna Marie, have a future. I always think I'm so lucky because I have all my limbs and I have my hearing and I have my eyesight and I have all of that. And at the end of the day, my, my pain will stop and my, heel, uh, my, worm, my, my burns will heal. Um, and, and I just keep on thinking, you're lucky to be here at all. You know, get up and get on with life. Um, God didn't spare you just to sit around moping and, and just live life to the full, is, is what I do. Terry Lloyd reporting there. One of the most poignant sights tonight is at Reading Station in Berkshire. Dozens of cars which were parked there yesterday morning remain uncollected tonight and fears are growing that their owners could be among the dead. Tonight the local MP said the crash could turn out to be one of the greatest tragedies the town has ever seen. Reading is one of the main stations along the Great Western Line supplying thousands of commuters into London every day. Our reporter Vanessa Collingridge is there now. Well, Trevor, I'm joined here at Reading Station by the editor of the Reading Evening Post, Andy Murrell. Andy, do we know how many Reading people were involved in the crash? Uh, no, we don't, but I'm afraid we're bracing ourselves for the worst here in Reading tonight. Uh, unconfirmed news agency reports, and I must say they are unconfirmed, uh, suggest that up to 50 people from Reading may have been killed in the crash. Now, obviously, that's devastating for us if that proves to be true, and we just pray tonight that it isn't. Now, obviously, Reading is a railway town, what kind of impact does it have on a place like this? As you say, this is a commuter town here. Uh, it's built around the railway, and virtually everyone in this town will either know someone who could have been on that train or was on the train, whether it be a family member, a friend or a work colleague. Um, so it will have a devastating effect if the reports that we have heard uh, come true. Now, commuter towns aren't exactly known for their sense of community. How are the people here coping with their grief? Reading is a community, uh, community town. It's a, it's a big town, but people know their neighbours. Um, they have vast networks of voluntary groups and uh, very strong community feeling in the town. We've already uh, had the churches that are going to be setting up uh, special facilities for people who are bereaved, and the council and the police have got together to set up a crisis centre for people who are involved in this. Uh, we will rally together as a community. We've been strong in the past when things have gone against us, and I know um, if, if the reports are true, we will be strong again, and we'll try to do our best to heal the pain that may come over the coming weeks. What are you going to be doing as a newspaper? Is there anything you can do? Well, at the moment, we're focusing mainly on the human loss here. Um, that's our only priority over the next few days. Uh, any talk of an inquiry or causes for the accident, that they can go on as they will. But as uh, Reading's local community newspaper, we're just worried about our people and uh, we just hope that these reports are not true. Andy Murrell, thank you very much. Trevor. Vanessa Collingridge at Reading Station. The Paddington crash is, as we said, Britain's worst rail disaster since 1952. And it follows a series of warnings about the condition of the track, the signals and the safety systems on board the trains. Now, while driver error is being blamed, as you heard, some experts believe that modern technology should be able to make train journeys fail-safe. But they accuse the rail companies of failing to invest and of putting profits before safety. Michael Nicholson investigates the reasons behind the crash and he examines the warnings that were ignored. Somehow, someone will find a way to explain all this away. They always do. We know that. 
By the time the promised inquiry publishes its conclusions, much of the pain will have passed, much of the outrage evaporated. We might even be persuaded by those who so cleverly persuade that it won't happen again, cannot happen again. But then, after this, yes, after this, we might not. Maybe this time those responsible will not be able to squirm and riddle themselves blameless. Maybe this time they will be brought to book. It doesn't seem right, does it? Not when I'm standing here to talk about cost effectiveness and operating profits. Not when they're still counting the dead down there. But at the end of this day, day two, that really is what it's all about. Because people who preached the gospel of safety first then put a price tag on it. Rail track, rail companies and governments alike agreed together that safety, real safety, effective safety, was really too expensive. More than 10 years ago, after the Clapham disaster, when 35 people died, we were promised that this would never happen again. The then Transport Secretary, Cecil Parkinson, told the House of Commons that better safety measures would be installed. I'm asking BR to deal promptly with all the recommendations addressed to them and to report to me on their implementation within three months. In particular, BR are already committed to two important new developments, automatic train protection and the installation of cab radios. I can assure the House that finance will not stand in the way of the implementation of the report. And so said Mr. Parkinson then, perhaps he did intend to introduce the fail-safe automatic train protection network, ATP for short. What he had in mind was already being used by the Swedes. It controlled the driver's speed as well as stopping them jumping red lights. And even four years ago we knew how it worked. Over permitted speed. There. You have it light break. Now the system allows me to release the brake when I'm under permitted speed. If the driver don't brake before the red light, the system will brake and stop the train before the danger point, the red light. After the Clapham disaster, the British government went to Sweden to look at their ATP system. They liked what they saw. BR estimated that the cost would be £140 million. The government promised to pay it. We showed them the system in operation. They had a possibility to drive the locomotives and, and uh, be on board in the train and really see what it's like. To, and, um, well, I think they got a good impression of it. My uh, barrister quoted from the... Um, Louise Christian, the, the solicitor who represents the victims of the Southall rail done. crash two years ago, has in her possession a secret memo sent by rail track to the government four years ago. On it, it says that ATP was so expensive they would instead install a cheaper, inferior system. It's quite clear that the railway industry has taken a decision that they will allow so many people to die a year because it is too expensive for them oh, to do on, something they can't, about that, it. That can't be their official policy. That can't be a, even a policy in secret, surely. They, they dress it up in acronyms. They call it CBA, cost-benefit analysis. But what it amounts to, VOL, value of a life, what it amounts to is that they are not prepared to spend more than a certain amount of money per life being saved. And, of course, they've got it wrong because so many people have now died that their cost-benefit analysis saying only three people a year was totally no, wrong. No, no, so are, are you saying that people sat around a table and said, this is the cost of a human life, we can't afford to, to save them? Are you saying that? Yes. Because that's a pretty damning thing to say. Well, I, I've seen the evidence that uh, people did do precisely that and the HSE Railway Inspectorate were involved and the government at the time were involved. The government knew about it? Yes, the um, rail track wrote to the Secretary of State for Transport and said, uh, we have decided that it is too expensive to save lives. We have the technology for you, I mean, proper safe I must, I must interrupt you. you. Is there evidence that the that Railtrack wrote a letter to the government saying we can't afford to save lives? 
that th th that was the effect of what they wrote. It was the effect of what was agreed in 1995, that automatic train protection would not be implemented nationally, even though it is a proper computerised modern system. The Drivers' Union Aslev, so often criticised for its cussed interference with train schedules and passenger comfort, has for years been campaigning for the installation of ATP. But safety, it says, has taken second place to profit. If you look, quite frankly, at what took place yesterday, and on the commercial side, and I know I shouldn't say that, because I am so emotional and so angry that people haven't been listening to this trade union and other rail experts in safety, if you looked at the effects on the rail track shares yesterday, for example, they went down by about 12 pence, they lost about a billion pounds, and that would have paid for automatic train protection. you got a point, haven't you? And to emphasise that point, if the government doesn't agree to ATP, it will ballot its drivers for strike action. My trade union will lead the fight on safety as we've always done. Pull the men out. We will take a decision if the train operating companies refuse to meet us, if they refuse to lay down a timetable for the implementation of automatic train protection. So if they, if they won't do it, you will? We will have to do it. Somebody's got to lead from the front, and we will have to do it. And Time he'll to have an eye like in John Cartledge of the Railway Users drivers, Committee. But he admits there is a dilemma. What price safety? At the end of the day, we've got to look again at what is meant by reasonable practical ability. What is the level of money that people are prepared to spend, and what are the benefits we get for it? Well, that's it, isn't it? It's money, money, money. Of course it comes down to that. Everything costs money, including safety, and you have to decide how much money you've got and what are your, what are your priorities for using it. Do you really quantify what a human life is worth? Can you say it's only worth two and a half million or it's only worth one and a half million? We're it's, not going to spend that money. I mean, you, you're, not, you're not on their side, are you? It's, it's a dreadfully cold-blooded thing to do, standing where we are today, looking at what is over my shoulder now. But that is how the government invests money in roads, to say what are the accident savings we will get. And the same decision is taken on the railways. They already spend more or relatively speaking, on the railways and on the roads. That's a compliment to the railways that these events are so rare. But when they do happen, of course they raise all these questions again and we're looking for the answers. Maureen Kavanagh is looking for those answers too. She lost her only son in the Southall crash two years ago and ever since she's devoted her life to rail safety. Maureen, you've seen something similar to this before. Um, yes. And it's still in printed. Absolutely. I find this quite horrific. It's brought everything back from two years ago, but it's much, much worse. And I feel so, so much for the people that are still waiting to find out what's happened to their loved ones. We went through that with our son. We had to wait hours and hours, and uh, at least we could identify him at the end of it. Um, but some of these poor people may find that hard, and it is tragic. Tragic that it happened, but more tragic that it should ever have been allowed to when so many people say it could have been prevented. Now is the time to take stock. I think we're getting the message. The people I've spoken to here today, outraged people, saddened people, all give me identical answers to the same question. Why? Money, money, money. Now, we are to have an inquiry. It will take months, months of paper shuffling, legal wranglings, political wranglings, the long string of promises to make good. But I don't think we'll need to wait those months for its conclusions. The consensus here seems to be that those we trusted considered our safety, our lives, a little too expensive, and that some sacrifice, some cost-cutting was necessary. Not in their worst nightmares could they have thought this would happen. Now, if that doesn't appall you, think of this that railway engineers considered this stretch of track to be among the safest in the country. Now, if that's so, God help us as we travel elsewhere. Michael Nicholson reporting there. As we said earlier, the injured had been treated by specialists at three hospitals. And joining us now from St. Mary's Hospital in London is Dr. Rachel Landau. Dr. Landau, can you tell me this? Are you happy that everything that could have been done was done for those patients that were brought in? Absolutely. We um, here at St Mary's have a, a very well rehearsed and well planned major incident uh, policy which uh, was put into effect immediately as we heard the news of the crash and uh, I think the 
casualties were received efficiently and, and dealt with efficiently by an amazing team effort from here at the hospital. Everybody pulled together marvellously to, uh, to help and, and deal with things as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Doctor, what are the risks of moving people so quickly from the scene to the hospital? Are any risks at all involved? I think it's a, it's a case of, of weighing up where the patients can be best dealt with. Obviously, within the hospital, there are adequate numbers of staff, there's equipment, and the expertise is there to deal with um, the patient's ongoing needs. And obviously, patients, like the casualties of this accident, suffering severe burns and multiple injuries, do um, uh, you know, have their condition change very rapidly. They can deteriorate and they need to be somewhere where they can be dealt with. And St Mary's being as close as it is to Paddington Station was in the position to uh, receive the patients promptly and, and deal with them promptly. And Doctor, what can be done to try to alleviate some of the obvious trauma um, that these people suffered? I think the injured are going to uh, suffer both physical and, and psychological trauma for a long time. There is the obvious getting over the, the physical injuries for those patients with severe burns and internal injuries, but there's also the psychological injury. And there's psychological injury to those that were admitted to hospital and also those patients, those victims that didn't come to hospital, but those people who lived through the moments of that crash and uh, who obviously have to deal with their recollections, their memories of the event and uh, what is sometimes known as the survivor guilt, why they should survive when the person who may have been sitting next to them a few moments earlier in the train may not have survived. Um, that's something that people will require good support, support from families, support from doctors, support from counsellors, and uh, I think people will take a long time to, to come to terms with what has gone on yesterday. And that goes for the staff as well. I think um, we were exposed to quite a horrific event yesterday as well. I think we're all used to dealing with trauma, but not in the vast numbers of patients that we received yesterday. And I think the staff will need the same support and the same counselling to, um, again, overcome their emotions and come to terms with what they, they saw yesterday. Dr Landau, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Now, some of those who left hospital have emerged with harrowing stories about the crash. At 8.15 yesterday, there were ordinary commuters and a crowded train making its way into London. Five minutes later, they were crawling from the wreckage of one of the worst rail disasters in living memory. Jonathan Maitland has been hearing their stories. Two miles from Paddington, what can go wrong two miles from Paddington? Things were flying around and people's uh, things were coming off shelves. And The first instance that I was aware of something being wrong was this almighty bang. The first feeling was, my goodness, I've been lucky. This is the story of two people who were feeling pretty lucky yesterday. Both of them got on the same train at the same time yesterday morning. It was the 7.29 from Didcot to Paddington. Immediately prior to the crash, we had the announcement of, please make sure you take all your belongings and have your tickets ready for collection at the barriers. And I seem to recall I was just then sorting my ticket out and the next thing I knew was an impact. A fireball in the distance coming rapidly towards us. I was convinced we had gone off the rails and landed in somebody's old accident because there was all this fire and, and it was like there's a metal or a concrete stanchion beside me. I can't remember what it is, but it's on fire. From the start of the impact to going through the fireball was five, six seconds plus. So it was plenty of time to think, I'm going into a fireball and I might die and I might not meet my family ever again. It was just a, a shocking and harsh reality. There's, um, my son is five weeks old and to think of all those things which should be happening in the future which I might not be able to take part of was just a, a very frightening thought. I looked out on the, uh, the, the south side of the line and I could see this red railway seat with someone lying on it and I thought, we don't have red railway seats on our train uh, and she was black from head to foot in soot and she was clearly burnt and she was in some distress but she was alive and then I suddenly thought well I don't understand this where's all this this coming from because it's not our train and then I realized we must all of that must have been us hitting something. Apart from those awful images one thing that's preoccupying a lot of people today is how seemingly trivial decisions can turn out to make the difference between life and death. Decisions like 
where you choose to sit on a train. I used to, to pay for a first class ticket and when I started travelling with Great Western I would have been in Coach G which was the second coach back from the lead of the train. That was on its side yesterday and after the Southall incident, although I didn't instantly change to my, my location in the train, it certainly gave me a bit of a heads up that uh, that's the first part of the train to be hit in any head-on incident and I then moved back to Coach F which would be the, the third of the, the first class trains, the buffet car. And then, just before the birth of my son, I, I thought, well, is this enough? I feel guilt in the sense that I'm here able to talk about the experience, and there are a lot of people that won't have that opportunity. I also feel guilt that, for some reason, I am still here. And many other people that I've traveled with probably every day for several years aren't here. And what right does anybody have to take their life when myself and others are still here? I just wasn't brave enough to go and fight the fire. There was a fire going on around the diesel tank and people were trying to put it out and there were people trapped in the coaches and there was a minor explosion and everyone ran away for a second and then went back. And when it was that explosion then I just, I just sort of froze. So I just stood there and so I felt dreadfully guilty yesterday afternoon and, and then I saw it on television and I just, well, it freaked me. And this is why I'm talking to you today because this is my way of trying to do something so that all those people just did not die in vain yesterday. Did you sleep last night? I did for about four, four, four and a half hours, and then I just went through it all again and again. In the immediate aftermath, I felt very angry that this accident had happened because it was just a, a carbon copy, as far as I see it, of Southall. And 24 hours later, I still feel equally angry that nothing came of that particular incident much of this has been said already, but we hear promises of uh, inquiries. It's very, very easy to just pump out hot air, and nothing's been done. So I'm not interested in what's been talked about in the past. I want to see action now. A colleague phoned me, and uh, I was just it. It was the last one in a whole series, and I just broke down. And the Scotland was here. I had a good greet, I had a good cry, and that helped. But today I've got a, a, a real cold anger because I've been watching the television and I've, I've been listening to what they've been saying and action is required to change the safety culture. Not overnight, well, no one can expect that, but it must happen soon. Otherwise, we'll have one of these every two years for as long as no one action is taken. Jonathan Maitland reporting. Well, as we have said, the final death toll remains unclear tonight, but the best estimates put the figure at over 100. ITN's Mark Austin has been at the scene all day, and for the very latest information, we are going to him now. Mark, um, what can you tell us about what's happening tonight, and can you give us any idea of what the priorities are now? Well, Trevor, what I can tell you is that the operation to extricate bodies from the wreckage down here below me uh, has stopped for the night, and the priority is now to get this uh, lifting equipment in. Um, once they get that equipment in, they can start lifting these carriages, but that presents uh, two more problems. Firstly, what they're going to find underneath these carriages and how they deal with those bodies, what they're going to find inside these carriages, how to get inside the tangled wreckage. Uh, and then a bigger problem. Many of these carriages, we're told, are so badly damaged, so weak that to lift them, but they may literally fall apart, particularly the burnt and charred carriages. And if this happens, they're concerned that they may be destroying evidence that may give vital clues as to how this uh, uh, crash occurred. So it's going to be a very delicate operation. Uh, tomorrow it's going to be a long operation. It could take two days, it could be three days before these tracks are clear, and it's going to be a desperate ordeal for the uh, fire crews and the rescue teams who are still working here tonight. Mark, you've been there for the best part of two days now. What are your lasting impressions of what you have seen over that time? Well, you know, Trevor, I arrived here yesterday and I immediately saw uh, the devastation, the, the, the burnt out carriages. And yet I, I then walked into literally uh, three to 400 people who had escaped it. And I spoke to them, uh, and they had their wounds, and they were shocked. But most of all, they were angry, and I think that anger has been reflected in, in this program tonight. And it was that anger was the first emotion that uh, 
uh, I, I, you know, that, that, that was brought home to me. Then the, the, the second thing was the, the, the rescuers, the teams working down there in these appalling conditions. And I think also tonight for the relatives who do not know whether their loved ones are dead or not, and for the fire teams working Mark, here, Mark, this is a desperate ordeal that is going to go on for several days. Mark, thank you very much. And that's all we have time for in this special edition of this programme. There'll be more news on the Paddington disaster and the ITV Nightly News following this programme and in the ITN bulletins tomorrow. But for tonight, from me and from all my colleagues here, good night and thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>